Good morning, dear Thai, dear Sangha. Um, today, Sunday the 4th of October, we are in the Lower Hamlet, the Assembly of Stars Meditation Hall. And uh, we're, I guess we're into the third week of the three months rain retreat uh, for Plum Village and many are joining us uh, online, uh, so let's say hello. <laughs> and um, the theme of this three month retreat is non-discrimination. There is a seed in all of us called the seed of non, the wisdom of non-discrimination. Near Vilkalpa Chinana, as I recall. And this, uh, this seed is innate in all of us. And when we sang the song, uh, We Are All the Leaves of One Tree, you know, it comes very naturally. It somehow feels right, you know, to be able to, to say that. There is, a, it is a song of the happiness of non-discrimination. When we can see uh, our interbeing nature, we see uh, that we are, together we are one, and we also celebrate, of course, our diversity. So. It would be boring if we were all the same. Um, it's such a rich uh, experience, for instance, to live in a Sangha where people coming from all different countries, backgrounds, with so many, uh, so many different uh, ancestral lineages behind them, and we get to hear these stories and we get to feel enriched and you know I think after 20 years in the Sangha um, I would never have dreamed of saying this before but I and even though I don't I still don't speak Vietnamese I can say I'm I'm partly Vietnamese now because I <laughs> because you know, I've been with you guys, the Vietnamese brothers and sisters that I, and I got to know some of you and I've, I've been to, to your country and I eat uh, some delicious dishes from Vietnam. So that would be an example. We, we take on each other's uh, stories. So you may have a story uh, about who Brother Phab Lai is and but I'm more than just one one story, more than just your story, uh, and the same goes for all of us. Even if we we wrote um, a biography, that would just be one story uh, about us, maybe containing lots of anecdotes. But who are we? Who are we really? It's, uh, it's a mystery. It's a journey to discover. And of course, we're always changing and we're taking on new stories and we're hopefully, hopefully growing, growing in our understanding and growing in our, in our love, growing our heart. Sometimes um, it's easy to stay with what we know. To stay maybe with the people we feel comfortable with, that we, we feel affinity to. Yeah. Living in Sangha does present us sometimes with the challenge to, and the opportunity to grow our heart to include a bit more, to widen our circle of love. 
to grow, to grow our compassion. We have so many opportunities to do that. I've often thought that if I was married and with a family, uh, it would there'd be more limited kind of possibilities for kind of discovering, making new uh, connections, etc. But also, there is one thing about uh, being in a close family, is you basically have to, you can't run away from each other. You have to somehow face. Uh, if you're to, to um, be happy in a family, you, you have to find a way to really go through things and face things. And you may get to know that person very deeply and the connection between you becomes kind of somehow very profound and deep in a way that uh, is not lim so limited because you go through these things together. In a Sangha, there's sometimes the danger that we can easily uh, just go to somebody else and if somebody is annoying us, we don't have to, to kind of get, face the situation with that person. We choose to sort of block them, maybe a little bit from our, from even from our sort of sight, we just sort of ignore a little bit. This can happen, and we should be aware when we're doing that, and be careful. Yeah. It's not um, realistic to say, oh, I just, I love everybody equally, and I can just be happy with absolutely everybody all the time. Um, but we should be aware when we're choosing to decide, uh, yeah, I can't, I don't have capacity. We have lots of nice words for it. I don't have capacity for this person at the moment, or yeah, I don't have space. But then we should also see that as our opportunity, our challenge, and sometimes challenge ourselves. And maybe um, we can choose, because we have the practices of meditation, we can even choose to bring that per difficult person to mind in a meditation when we are peaceful and centered. And yes, we recognize the difficulty we're having with that person. Yes, we recognize some aversion coming up. We don't have to solve all of that to then also smile to them and wish them to be happy, wish them to be safe, wish them to be, to be free. If they do are uh, causing problems, and it is something, uh, they're causing some suffering around, we can know, we can bring to mind that if that's happening, it's because of some suffering in them that is at the root cause. So we can also let go, let go of uh, the judgment. There is a, a saying from the Indian Sioux uh, tribe, uh, they say the praying to the Great Spirit, let me not judge a man until I have walked in their moccasins. Moccasin is a, is a word for the, for the shoe. So walk, when we are able to walk in somebody else's shoes, it means that we get to see, experience what is going on for them. We may have a, a better um, understanding of them and why they are behaving in the way that they are that is causing us the problem or causing yeah, some difficulty and we are able to let go because we understand, ah, yeah, I get it. Uh, I get why you're behaving like that. You have, this is, 
this is because that is. Maybe this happened in the past. You have this sensitivity. Yeah. So I know for myself when I um, I've had irritation with a brother. Every time I take the time to to go to that brother and just ask them about their life. Maybe I ask them about their aspiration, how they came to Plum Village, just getting to know them. But also I find very, very helpful is getting to understand their, their past, you know, what, what is, what they've gone through in life. Again, it's only, you can only get a partial story, right? But it can be very helpful when we connect with somebody and we really understand them as a, as a human. Uh, it's amazing how the, the irritation can just drop. You say, oh, okay. It's, um, so, practice of inclusivity in the Sangha, but there is also the practice of inclusivity should also be applied to ourself. When we practice uh, mindfulness of breathing, we get in touch with, we use the awareness of the breath to bring our mind and body together. We get a chance to be in touch with our body what is happening in our body. We notice uh, if there is feelings of discomfort, we also are aware of that and smile to that and say, okay, maybe we adjust our posture, but maybe there is something of a headache or something of an ache or a pain. And we recognize and we with our out breath, we, we relax, but we don't push away the, the painful feeling. We can smile to it with our, our love and allow it to, to be there and say, it's okay for you to be there. And the same goes with our feelings our mental formations, our states of mind. We can, we can very well smile to, to what is, is there. Even though the feeling may be one of anxiety, there is the, with the meditation, we're able to also bring connect with our Buddha nature, which is to say our compassion, our stability, our calm, and offer that energy to be there with what is, with the anxiety. So establishing ourselves in awareness of the breath, mindfulness of the body, we cultivate some Buddha nature energy, some stability, some peace, some spaciousness. And with that, we can offer that to also what is, is maybe agitated in us, not at peace. So with just, uh, three breaths, we, we do like that. We, there is also, there's already a kind of different thing going on. So we know that this, this is the practice to take care of emotions, of, of feelings. And we can also call it sort of radical acceptance. When we just truly accept how things are, 
right in this present moment. We don't try to change uh, what is, what is. What is there we recognize and we say, ah yes, that is there. We try to give, we can give it a name, it can help to give it a name. This is, this is some anxiety, this is uh, some agitation, this is some craving even. Maybe this is um, some irritation. And we say, hello, I know you're there and I know you have a very good reason to be there. I might not know quite why at this moment, why you're there, but for sure you, there is a reason why you're there and it's okay. Headache, the same thing. Uh, a state of mind where we're feeling closed and we're thinking, oh, but I want to practice to have an open state of mind, you know, to feel very spacious. But we recognize, I'm in a closed state of mind at the moment. And we bring our awareness to that, we name that, yeah, and that's how I am. And we don't fight that. We allow that to be what it is. And just bringing that, that awareness to how we are in this moment uh, can change the actually, you could say, sort of, uh, not ironically, but it's kind of counterintuitively. <laughs> it's like you wouldn't expect, but it's by the acceptance that the thing actually changes. It's like you're giving it space for something to, to open, to relax, and for, in a way, the more healthy, natural, whole state of you to, to become, uh, to, to f things to flow again and for you to f feel your energy coming back. And the, so things don't stay static when we're practicing mindfulness. But we have to start, if you like, with where we are and allow ourselves to just be. Yeah. It's also the practice of aimlessness, to not put something as a goal of in front of us, but to just be, recognize how we are just now and smile to that with, ex with acceptance and, and also gratitude, you know, because there are many things going, going well and to even just to be able to be sitting here breathing and aware of our mental state is already a condition for happiness. So that is also connected with that practice of the, the door of liberation called aimlessness. Have one sound of the bell and we can practice to, to breathe to, to just recognize just exactly how things are going, wh where we're at right now. And just even if you can name just maybe one, two or three things that are going on for you right now. And just smile to that and say, oh yeah, that's going on. Like maybe a curiosity of where Brother Fapli is going to go with this talk. Maybe you're wondering, uh, is I hope he's going to finish within the hour. I don't know. Or maybe you're, you're thinking, I'm a bit uncomfortable. Uh, it's a bit too, I don't know, whatever you see. You just notice and you relax uh, to that, accepting what is.
So the, thank you for your practice there. I realized I was maybe projecting my own thoughts onto you. Yeah. I'm wondering what, and um, the seed of inclusivity, of non-discrimination, near Vilkalpa Jnana. <laughs> it's innate in all of us. And it means uh, also, as I've been sharing, not excluding. So if we talk about inclusivity, it means not, not excluding, allowing, allowing in. There are many um, things that we, we know about ourselves, about our loved one, about our brother, our sister, and there are many things we know that we don't know. And we maybe want to take time to, to find out, as I said, it can be a beautiful thing to, to find out more about each other. And then there's a lot of uh, things that we maybe the vast majority, uh, things we don't know, we don't know. In other words, there's a lot of, um, yeah, there's a whole area we have to acknowledge, like there's a lot of things we don't know that we don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. Some of, the th some of those things are um, unconscious prejudice, unconscious uh, sort of bias, if you like, that we, when we, we're not aware of, then we don't know about them. But we can, if we become aware that we have unconscious bias, it can also help us with the um, practice of asking ourselves, am I sure? Am I sure? I'm going to tell you uh, a little story. And for this I want you to close your eyes actually and just visualize. So if you can close your eyes this is a little ex experiment, actually, but uh, just yeah, you just picture picture a couple. They have they're very happy because they've both been invited to this very special conference, but it's uh, in another country, and they have to take a plane. This is pre-COVID times, okay. <laughs> So they have to take a take a plane to get to this to this uh, country, and they on the plane, one of the couple gets quite scared because of some turbulence. But then the captain comes onto the the speaker and says um, says some words to to really calm people down and say, you know, don't worry, we're we're experiencing a little turbulence, but we're going to be okay. And um, also, you know, the, they, so they get, get through that, and then they arrive at the conference, and the CEO, the, the head of the company that's hosting the, the conference, gives uh, an opening address and it's very powerful, very, very well done. And at the end of his address, uh, a Zen master comes on stage. Okay, you can open your eyes. And the question is, um, with the couple, did you see a man and a woman? 
Yeah, it could have been a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. There are such couples, <laughs> right? That's just an assumption we made. Did you see the captain of the plane? Well, first of all, in the, in the couple relationship, uh, they were sitting on the plane, right? And then there was this turbulence. And I mentioned that one of the couple was getting very nervous. Was that the man or the woman for you? So you make an assumption, right? What about the captain? Was he white? Was he black? Was he Asian? Maybe Vietnamese? Anybody saw a Vietnamese captain? <laughs> you saw a man? Yes, no, that's, that's the, the question to you, yeah. Did you, see a, did you see a white male as a captain? Anybody not? Good, right, because you've done the course. <laughs> and how about the uh, CEO? Oh, also a white male? A man? Mm, could have been a woman? Anybody saw that the CEO that gave this powerful address at the talk was a woman? Yeah, great. <laughs> and uh, so that was two out of uh, 200. <laughs> and then the Zen master, we all saw Thai, right? <laughs> so um, the little exercise just helps us recognize that we have something called uh, unconscious bias. And it's natural because it's the way the brain works, that we take shortcuts to what is the kind of most, uh, based on an accumulation of all our experience. In life we, we kind of see that uh, uh, this is just the, the thing that's served up to us by our mind. This is what, what you see. So you were very honest. You probably knew this is a bit of a trick, but you just agreed, yeah, that's what I saw, because the, because the mind, uh, unless you really apply yourself to kind of, I'm going to think of something different, it will just naturally offer you this kind of stereotype, if you like, this kind of shortcut to, based on your experience. So there is nothing wrong with that, because the mind needs to take shortcuts. It can't possibly uh, look at every single possibility and give you those images at the same time. You've got to get on with the story. You've got to get on with life and interacting. So we're constantly, the nature of the mind is to, to take shortcuts and even fill in blanks often. So it goes even further than this because our perception is often projection of, uh, we, th we have a few markers that say this is this is a tree, this is uh, this person, and immediately, based on our past experience, we put a whole picture onto that. So being able to um, recognize that is, is important, that the mind is working like that. It's important because actually, although, as I said, it's, there's nothing wrong with having unconscious bias, we can see that it can play out in different ways in our interactions in life and lead to um, prejudices, judgments, putting some, judging somebody as inferior or even somebody to be to be feared, to have aversion, you know. If you um, come from uh, a town where you've never seen, uh, so supposing you've never seen a gay couple before, in a, and then you're in a restaurant, and you get this feeling of, this is very strange, there's another thing that happens biologically 
when we perceive something different, there's a kind of mechanism from the glands that, from the pituitary, and it kind of goes to eventually the adrenal glands and the kidneys. And it just happens in milliseconds that we produce cortisol. We produce a stress-producing hormone. And we go into a sort of stressed place, which is kind of connected with the fight-flight kind of mode. So if we're in that kind of mode, the way we're perceiving things, just because something is different, yeah, it's not even, we don't even know that there's a threat or anything, there's nothing happened, but we, we maybe are going to be thinking differently because of that. We're going to be um, perceiving differently and our feelings will also be affected. You know, the five uh, universal mental formations. Contact, attention, perception, feeling, volition. I think I got the right order. They, they happen so, so quickly. And there's a kind of, it's like a, a unit of consciousness. So you, you can't catch it. You can't catch it, and into, it's not so easy to, okay, you have such a strong mindfulness practice that you can catch that happening. Can you catch the cortisol before the cortisol is released and you're in that stress mode? Probably not. But at least maybe you can recognize, oh, I got stressed here, I got this, maybe I got this thought of aversion, and we question, and then... I'm putting it onto this situation, onto this person, onto these people, and I'm making, I'm starting to make assumptions about them, yeah. And this can happen, and that then that can get reinforced, maybe reinforced by other people like us. And then we start having conversations and building a whole story about these, the other, the other people, the other person. And this, this is a kind of natural process, actually, that can happen. Where do we intervene? Well, basically, we intervene just as soon as we recognize it with our mindfulness. We see what is going on and we stop, breathe, and ask the question, am I sure? Is this really, yeah. So wherever we found ourselves in that process, and maybe it's been years since you've been holding uh, these views, or maybe it just it just happened in a in a one interaction. I got some sort of bad feeling with this person. Just ask the question: Is it about them, or is the what is being triggered in me? Is it just because they're different, or do I have some that past bad experience? Can also be the reason, right? So learning to, to be asked this question, am I sure? In order not to, to jump to, to our conclusions. There is um, a quote from an African-American woman called Maya Angelou that I, I somehow didn't bring. But I just, it's not that, I just, so if I paraphrase it, as I recall, she said something like, uh, for her, racism is like a blanket which sneaks up every night and covers uh, her and s every morning she has to peel black the blanket. And she's referring to this, um, all of this unconscious bias that is somehow reinforced by 
uh, society that where there is this kind of collective prejudice, collective judgment just based on something like color of skin. I don't want, even it's called racism, is a misnomer because it implies something to do with race. But what is race but a mental construct made by people to divide people? It's not, it's not a, it should never have been a kind of true, yeah, okay, so you come from this country, you have this culture, you have these traditions, but this term race is already very, very dangerous. But just based on color of skin, people get uh, put into these boxes, and then there is this discrimination, this is called racism. And Maya Angelou, who is uh, an African-American writer, you know, so she also recognizes she's affected by that collective prejudice. and has to do daily work to recognize what is going on, she said, every morning, and to kind of check it, am I sure, and letting go, and coming back into freedom. Freedom to, to be in touch with just who I am, without that prejudging. to get back to a place of confidence and your true potential as a human being. Mm. Sound of the bell. In um, the United States, uh, racism and injustice based on on this kind of this kind of prejudice is very um, clear, and it's it's quite devastating to the, the degree to which it's uh, experienced there. Not only in the US, of course. But I want to mention uh, the US because there's an example of a woman who in 1968, the day uh, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, decided she was a school teacher and she decided to do something uh, with her class of third graders, eight-year-olds, basically. And there's a documentary that I very much recommend called A Class Divided, which you can watch on YouTube. 
maybe not in the three-month retreat. But I don't know. Maybe it's educational. Maybe we can together watch it. But it's a very interesting documentary. Um, it shows her doing this exercise with with the children, which she then did a number of years after. You see, she was very um, aware that although she was teaching in a school and it was only a white-only kind of area, just demographically, it was a small town in Iowa. A uh, small town, maybe 3,000 people. So in, in with this uh, class uh, she had, um, she always taught about different cultures, uh, First Nation people, and also about prejudice and racism and the importance of seeing each other as brothers. And so teaching non-discrimination, basically. But she was also aware that she wasn't sure, however, that it was being uh, taught and the children were saying all the right things you know, if she'd asked them a question, yes, miss, yes, we, we love everybody, <laughs> we don't discriminate, um, black people, brown people, uh, first, you know, it, it's all the same. But th what she did was she wasn't convinced. <laughs> and so she, yeah, very upset by what had happened, and she decided to do this radical class where she divided the children for a day into blue-eyed and brown-eyed children. So she asked the blue-eyed to sit one side and the brown-eyed children to sit another. She divided the class like that and then she said, for today um, we're going to um, separate and for today the, the blue-eyed children are going to be on top and the brown-eyed children, um, they are going to be uh, on the bottom, and then we're going to switch tomorrow. So she told them what she was going to do in advance. So today, everybody knows that um, brown-eyed people are not as intelligent as blue-eyed people. They're, they are um, pretty stupid, they're very slow to learn, and they they don't know how to listen, actually. That's the problem with brown-eyed people. They need to be trained. They're trainable, but it takes more time. And she would talk like this to these eight-year-olds, kind of reinforcing this idea that, you know, pretty soon, even though they knew it was an exercise, the brown-eyed boys and girls were like, <laughs> like this, and the blue-eyed boys and girls were like, hmm. I'm, I'm the superior one today, right? And some of them were just confused and looking around. But by the end of the day, there had been a real thing happen. So some of the children had been, who were on top, had been enjoying their chance to be the king <laughs> and put the other group down. Other peop others were just staying pretty normal. In the playground they weren't allowed to mix together. And um, there were certain like privileges taken away from them. So they got, the, and they had to wear a collar also just to make sure because you said, well we can't tell if you're brown-eyed from a distance so we, you have to wear this collar. The teacher said she, she really didn't like doing this <laughs> class, uh, but it was, uh, she felt it, uh, it had a purpose. She actually did a test with the children in the middle of the day, spelling test and maths test, and found that their scores went down to the, what they were before. If they were in the group that was being told that they were inferior, so they got that message, even in a day, and literally they couldn't uh, 
do the test so well, and the opposite for the ones that were told they were superior. They were doing quite well in the tests, even maybe even better than before. And then the next day it was reversed, and the reverse was seen on the tests. So the yeah. And so they both got to experience the same thing, being on top and being on bottom, and being, being told that they're inferior just because of some arbitrary thing, the color of their eyes. But they, yeah. And then they got to reunite. And they, wow, when you see the documentary, the children are like just so happy, so relieved, because, and they, it's like they, they come back together, are united, as a class. And she said they became like a family at that point. It's like they'd learned how to hurt each other and they'd learned what it feels like to be hurt by the other just based on this prejudice concept, you know, I'm inferior because of my eyes, seemingly something very silly, right? Doesn't why it, we don't have. It, we would just laugh at that idea. Interestingly, just to take the test thing a bit further, she then tested her class for some years after, and they were above average for things like maths and spelling and all sorts of things that didn't would, you wouldn't think would be related to that lesson about prejudice but it seems their academic ability increased and she even sent the results to Stanford psychology department and they confirmed that this was a real result and they couldn't understand how you can shift academic ability within 24 hours so, so significantly. It seems that um, when we get that understanding of um, the real understanding about what it is to be discriminated and also then the kind of insight of non-discrimination at that, at that deeper level than just intellectual or just, you know, just knowing what to say. It opens something in the heart and therefore in the mind and and maybe that can explain this natural increase in intelligence. Maybe also because the class became more united as a family, I don't know, but it was a very interesting result. And they had a reunion 18 years later, uh, all these, these children that you saw and you literally could recognize them a little, you know, you could see that the exact children you saw in the documentary coming back as adults. And they said that that one time had changed their entire life, their trajectory, their way of thinking. They could never discriminate. Again, it was, it was a, a life-changing experience for them. And they were extremely grateful for it. So this is, um, yeah, and when they would hear their, their friends, their white friends, sharing prejudice, racist remarks, they would feel very uncomfortable, and they would also make a, sta make a stand, say something about it. They wouldn't just let it, you know, ignore it. This is the kind of things that they were sharing in the reunion. And you may think also that... Um, Huh. Only children would be fooled by such a silly exercise and take it in like that. But actually she went on to do this exercise with adults and incorporations and even on an Oprah Winfrey show. She separated uh, the blue-eyed adults from the brown-eyed adults and did exactly the same, same trick on them, you know, st speaking to them the blue-eyed people in a negative way, you know, you're like this, you're, you are, and there was, and people got, just in one hour, these adults got so upset, you know, at this, the disgraceful assumptions about them just because they've got blue eyes. 
and at one point uh, somebody said that in a, an adult setting and she, she said to her, um, oh, so you, you, uh, you're upset because I'm making a generalization about you and you're saying that I can't possibly know you as an individual and I'm making a generalization about you based on your blue eyes. And she said, yes, I'm really upset about that. <laughs> and this is just in one hour, you know, recognizing. Uh, and then after that, there was, a, of course, a debrief, and they recognized, wow, now I've had a taste of what it's, and it's just a taste, you know, of what it's like to receive discrimination just based on something arbitrary. You can say, eye color, but then skin color is also an arbitrary thing, right? So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a I found that a, uh, an interesting uh, experiment that she did, but it's something, yeah, she said, don't, it would be good to do this for children in classes, uh, to roll it out, but the problem is its potential is quite harmful because it's quite a strong thing to do. So you have to be, it has to be done very carefully, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, I'm going to just uh, take some time to go to the board. I want to share something about the, the Diamond Sutra. So. Sister Annabelle actually gave the monastics a, a talk about uh, including this Diamond Sutra and the wisdom uh, that we can get from it. And I'm, I recall last year the theme of the three month retreat was on Mother Earth, uh, protecting, taking refuge in Mother Earth. And the Diamond Sutra, as Ty has often said, is the f maybe the first certainly the first book, because the Diamond Sutra is considered the oldest book in history, but it's, uh, it's the most ancient teaching on deep ecology. But I would say, uh, and it's also a deep teaching on non-discrimination and how to practice non-discrimination, how to get the understanding. It um, defines four boxes. We can call them boxes. You know when you, you put something in a box? It's like another way of saying you give it, give it a label, a category. You go in this box, you go in that box. This, these, these categories, these distinctions we make and it challenges those distinctions and basically says these distinctions, kind of, they are at the root of our suffering because they are not just, they are these distinctions when not checked, not understood for what they are, um, cause suffering because the, they're about discrimination. The first box is self or person. The second box is human beings. So the first one is to say, in our mind, we think of ourselves as a self. separate from other selves. We are just this. I am this self. I am separate from you. 
then we go to human beings. Along with that, we also say, I'm a human being, separate from other living beings, which becomes the next category. So all, all living beings. And then we think of living beings as also distinct from non-living beings of like, n namely maybe animals, uh, sorry, minerals. So you have living beings and then you have minerals. Maybe you even don't think of vegetables as living beings, although we know that's also not true. We've already, you know, we already experiment with seeing life is, is, in, is in everything with our minds, but this is a teaching which really you know, points out that this, dis this distinction is uh, very fundamental that we make, we're always separating. So for instance, um, we think of uh, living beings as separate from Mother Earth. We don't see that it's as if like Mother Earth is just a platform on which we exist. We don't see the whole interaction. And then the last box is lifespan. So the Diamond Sutra um, talks about how we categorize ourselves like this, I'm a, I'm, I'm a self, I'm a human being, I'm a living being, I have a certain lifespan, and also how we uh, discriminate between myself and other human beings, human beings and other living beings. When it comes to lifespan, it's, it's also interesting to look at that. Uh, why, why is that a discrimination? Surely we have a lifespan of, of a certain number of years. What's wrong with, with that, seeing that? When we go to examine uh, these notions of a self, human being, living beings, lifespan, we, we realize that they are very, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, um, they're a conventional designation, a way to, to label something, but it's not the whole truth. It may have its certain, a certain use, but if we're caught in it, we're in trouble. And one of the, the, the ways, therefore, it gives us in the sutra to think about it is to say, it's a dialectic where it says, okay, a self, how can you say you're a self? Um, a man is made entirely of non-man elements. And when you can see that, then you can call that person a man. When you see that that man is made entirely of non-man elements. The same would go, go for any phenomenon, a mountain. When you look at a mountain, you see, oh, that's a mountain. You put the label on it. But when you are able to see that that mountain is made entirely of non-mountain elements, namely the four elements, the water, the rock, the, the air, the, the earth, it's made of, um, yeah, it's arisen from the earth, you can see, if you look in geology, you see, you can start to just see physically this mountain is not, uh, it's made entirely of non-mountain elements. There is, and there is no one element of the mountain that I can say, oh, this is the mountain element. Everything that is a mountain is non-mountain elements. And the same goes with uh, us as people, of course. And then, it is at that point that the dialectic says, therefore, 
I can say it's a mountain. So because I see that A, um, well, I won't use that one. <laughs> because I can see the mountain is not a mountain, I can say it's a mountain. So that's the kind of the clever dialectic in the Diamond Sutra. So it invites us to do that kind of look at things. So when we, we put a label on something, we think we know what it is, we ask the question, am I sure? And we look more deeply. And eventually we go on a journey where, of discovery and we discover it's not that, it's all of these other things. And then we can say, give it back the name if we choose. We may choose to give it a different name. In the meantime, if we're living not just conceptually, not just as a, a, an intellectual thing of like, what is a mountain, what is a, a man, but we're living from this assumption of a self, it can cause a lot of suffering because it gives us a feeling of being separate from. Not to mention judging whether we are inferior or f superior to another self, another person. You come to the same with human beings towards other living beings. We distinguish our species as special and we make a judgment that human beings are superior. We may come to the conclusion because of, the f of what we're doing on the planet that actually we are inferior to other animals because we're destroying the planet. But that would be to jump to the complex of inferiority from superiority and base, they're both based on the notion of a separate self of be, and of you know, not seeing our interbeing nature. It's only when we have this um, self idea, this separate self idea, that we make these comparisons and we put ourselves in these states of mind thinking I'm superior or I'm inferior. So Tyus said um, to try to counteract the superiority complex with the inferiority complex is to try and uh, take a poison to cure the effect of another poison. So we shouldn't do that. Rather, what we're invited to do uh, in the meditation on, in the Diamond Sutra is to see the true nature is the nature of interbeing, that things contain, contain each other, and that these distinctions are, however much we kind of, they have a conventional purpose, they are in the end false distinctions. They don't actually help us be in touch with reality as it is, to actually be connecting with, with life and to be um, in harmony. How do we, for instance, um, make, therefore, reconnect ourselves to, to other living beings? You know, when man has become so dominant and separated in a way by language and we can be very proud of our ability for language and we've lost the capacity to to relate to other living beings because they don't speak our language whatever that is but if you spend time in nature you spend time with animals you maybe learn their language it's not a verbal language you learn the language of the trees. You get in tune with, in touch with, in a way where there is communication. And you humble yourself to ask for that communication, to open up the channel, to actually 
sense what is being communicated. It's actually more to do with not learning a language, but learning to, to drop our way of um, assuming that there is no communication going on and allowing ourselves to, be, to open up, to, to, to listen. And then we may work very well find out wonderful things and we can really start to understand. We can get into the, the experience of what it is to be, for instance, uh, a different kind of animal by spending time with them and you know there's men there's some nature documentaries which uh, really show this up you know I don't know I haven't seen yet but there's a there's one about an octopus called my octopus teacher and this relationship between an octopus and a, and a man there's there's many uh, examples of where relationships between humans and non-human animals uh, challenges our, our notions very deeply. We, we start to see, ah, oh, I, was, I was wrong. The animal mind has its own uh, likes and dislikes, thoughts, even beliefs and, uh, and ideas and stories. So it's not just um, so we get we start to realize I remember watching um, a documentary about uh, which featured a, a black leopard and when this woman who was able to to connect with this leopard she understood that it had a lot of concern one of the reasons it was uh, not doing well was it was really wondering what had happened to these cubs in this former place and you I was suddenly touched by really feeling like this leopard has uh, something we would call compassion you know like it really really cares and it, it goes beyond just an instinctual instinctive maternal but it was I want to mention about um, lifespan when we we think about lifespan we think oh well i'm i'm going to be gone tomorrow <laughs> uh, i won't be here anyway so i leave a mess for the next generation to clear up it's going to be their problem i feel sorry for them i'm sorry about that but we left a bit of a mess for you but when we challenge our notion of lifespan we realize when we challenge these notions we realize that um, we can't be so sure uh, about this, this arbitrary idea that of birth and death. And we know this from our t teachings, that um, our so-called birth and death have their events in life, but they don't mark uh, the ultimate arising from non-being to being, from being to non-being, of a, of a separate self. They're part of, uh, you know, life continues. And if we see ourselves as a separate self, we may be caught in this notion of lifespan. But when we see our deep interconnectedness, of course it's very evident with, for instance, biological children, we see them continuing us into the future. And but it goes, it goes beyond that. So, when we look at these boxes, we, we see how we discriminate and we can see the suffering that arises. When we allow ourselves to discriminate human beings from living beings, we have allowed, for instance, the killing every, uh, of billions of animals every year to eat we separate ourselves from their suffering. We allow conditions to arise for the mass extinction, 
for, you know, I think um, 60% of all wild animals biomass has gone since 1970 the spe and the species extinctions are thousands of times higher than the background the not like normally you may have naturally five species going extinct every year but now it's more like between a thousand and ten thousand so it's we've allowed that to happen because we've made this distinction yeah we've we've separated ourselves off and we've created in a way our own zone comfort zone and partly through fear we've excluded and the same um, with regards to mother earth and the mineral world we've stopped to see we we thought that the the water the air was something we could just exploit the minerals and we don't see its interconnectedness with life, it's part of life. So this is, to understand this sutra as a sutra on teaching as non-discrimination, it's worth a very beautiful sutra for this. Within, um, between these two boxes, we have a lot of boxes. which I've already shared about in terms of um, how we just make distinctions based on culture, where we're from, color of skin, these kind of sub boxes, maybe age, maybe gender, maybe sexual orientation, and we put people in boxes. So we think that they are the other and we either have fear of them or we, you know, we judge them somehow, we make a story about them. There's, um, and this is um, what we want to work to, to not do. So we sort of have to deconstruct those constructs and that does take a certain amount of work to recognizing where they are, to step, to recognizing our unconscious bias, to also, and to ask the question, am I sure? And to try to flip it around, to go into looking at our relationships with people and who we may be excluding and challenge ourselves. That's what I was sharing at the beginning. And this is, this is good work to do. And also, to transform our own suffering. To look, to see where, what is happening for us. The meditation um, of accepting ourselves just as we are, of recognizing, oh yeah, this is me also, and not excluding uh, suffering that we, we have inside ourselves and not judging ourselves. So where you see you have judgment, you don't judge that, rather you get curious about it. It becomes, it's not, doesn't have to make you feel, oh, I'm such a bad person, but rather you say, no, um, this is there because of con social reasons. This is there because of my upbringing and education, and I can ex examine, examine that. I can bring curiosity and uh, I can start to look at that. So there are many um, ways we can practice actively this spirit of inclusiveness. When we sing the song that we sang at the beginning, uh, it feels good. But bringing it to, to really um, realizing it in our, 
our daily life. It's an, uh, it's a, it requires some, some work, so it's, it's good work. So when we're transforming our own suffering, we're also clearing the way to, to having more space for each other and challenging uh, those ourselves to widen our circle of love. I'm going to finish with reading the, the second mindfulness training. Because, um, yeah, I feel it speaks to something of our time. And I'm, I'm recalling uh, an incident I had, a, a time when I was, before I was a monk, and I went, went to a, a pub. That is a place where you drink alcohol in England uh, with a friend of mine from school. And he was very uh, concerned about my going to become a monk, because I was already talking about that. And in the pub, he was even more concerned that I wasn't drinking alcohol, because yeah. I'd taken the five mindfulness trainings. Yeah. And then when I, when I was talking with him, he did you know, show an interest. And he said, well, what's it all about, this Buddhism thing, you know, this Plum Village thing? And I had in my back pocket a copy of the, the mindfulness trainings. And I said, if you just read this, you'll, you'll get what I'm, why, I hope you'll get what I'm, what, it's the best I can do to explain it. So he took, he took time. He was only on his first pint of beer, so he wasn't drunk yet. And he took the time to read it. And I s I was wondering what, what his reaction would be, and he, he looked at me kind of stunned, and he said, if the whole world followed this, there's, everything would be great. <laughs> you know? And, you know, we weren't, at that time we weren't even talking about, um, this was, you know, the version before this, which is, and now this one's even, even stronger, right? It's even more, more full. So I was, I was touched by that, to see that that seed of desire for things to go the right way for the world. You know, this guy is an engineer. He, he, we never talked about putting the world right or before. You know, that wasn't the kind of conversation we'd have. But that's what came to him. And I'm also aware that when uh, we think about all of the things going, going badly and the amount of, of um, prejudice there is, which is, seems to be on the increase. Social media, instead of uniting us, it's, it's somehow dividing us and bringing us more into bubbles of, of uh, more kind of discrimination. And sometimes people are cynically trying to do that, to, to kind of feed the fire of discrimination, of hatred. And we see that on the increase, and then we see forests burning, and we see animals becoming extinct, and the insect population, they call it an insect apocalypse. And it just becomes very, very um, uh, heavy when we look. And I remember Thai was once asked in a Dharma talk, when we see this, these things happening, does Thai not get... Uh, where, where does Thai get his hope from? And Thai answered very simply um, that when he sees uh, many people in a retreat, at the end of a retreat, making their commitment to the practice concretely through receiving the five mindfulness trainings, Thai has hope. Yeah. Somehow, um, if we can find, because there is something so 
beautiful in the language of the five mindfulness trainings that I have never in my years of doing families, etc., I've always been surprised at how many people from all sorts of different backgrounds are willing to, to receive them, be they Christian, Jewish, um, Muslim, or, or other faith, or, ju or, or just very secular. They, and they, they, it somehow speaks to them. The only reasons, occasionally there may, there may be a question if there's a, if, you know, can I take this because I, if I'm also a Catholic, am I somehow betraying? But mostly the questions, the vast majority of the questions are, can I do this? Because it's a call to action. And the questions become more that. And then it becomes a real commitment. Yeah. They're not questions about faith and about belief. And this, this is a, a beautiful gift we have, therefore, to, to try to speak a language that is not uh, going to divide people on this side of the fence or the other. It doesn't matter um, what, what opinions you have on certain subjects. If, if we've got this language of love and um, talking about things that basically, basically everybody can see is as it makes sense. That is, that is a hope, that is a reason for hope. Because if as a human family we cannot stay united and see the problems we face together, it's difficult to see how we can, you know, bring ourselves to, to the challenges. True happiness, aware of the suffering caused by exploitation, social injustice, stealing and oppression. I am committed to practicing generosity in my thinking, speaking and acting. I am determined not to steal, and not to possess anything that should belong to others. And I will share my time, energy, and material resources with those who are in need. I will practice looking deeply to see that the happiness and suffering of others are not separate from my own happiness and suffering. That true happiness is not possible without understanding and compassion. And that running after wealth, fame, power, and sensual pleasures can bring much suffering and despair. I am aware that happiness depends on my mental attitude and not on external conditions, and that I can live happily in the present moment simply by remembering that I already have more than enough conditions to be happy. I am committed to practicing right livelihood so that I can help reduce the suffering of living beings on earth and reverse climate change. So I offer that uh, to end my talk just because I don't think we can, it, this training more than any speaks to uh, the subject of recognizing suffering in the world and making a positive volition and there are many ways that we can act and do, but remember to root it also in the basic practice of coming back to oneself, taking care of what is, recognizing what is there, accepting yourself. And then with that um, peace that you, we get when we accept ourselves, we have energy to also look to the other and to, to do what we can. So thank you for your kind attention and we'll have three sounds of the bell. <laughs>